exploring the physiology of cosmic consciousness. That's a pretty broad topic, and I think I'm going to narrow it in and, and more specifically talk about microtubules and this uh, unique concept of orchestrated objective reduction, which is a possible physiological mechanism for sensing spiritual influences. But first, uh, let me give you some personal background because basically I I grew up, you know, Anglican, choir boy, altar boy, serving out communion, um, and grew to reject the Bible as logically inconsistent, you know, as I became more technically aware. And it, it didn't appear that Christianity's God needed me at all. And I certainly didn't need him. I was doing just fine, thank you very much, as executive vice president of research and development um, at the largest turbine engine overhaul company in the world. You know, I, I certainly didn't need him. And then one of our uh, physicists with 45 patents introduced me to the Arantia book. You know, and I went from needing reason and mechanisms, not rhetoric and magic. I needed physics, not psychics. And Erwin Ginsberg, back in 1985, gave me the Arantia book, which then gave me a rational God, showed me why God needed me, and even hinted at technically feasible mechanisms to accomplish this. So after 38 years, essentially of continuous reading and study, uh, you know, after reading the Urantia book, all, all books are sort of compared to the Urantia book, and all science was co being compared to the Urantia book. Um, so I'm just now starting to find some of the technically feasible mechanisms using physics and physiology um, of how these material energies can possibly interface or interrelate or um, talk to or with uh, spiritual energies. And today we're going to look at some of the possible coherence mechanisms between the electromechanical, uh, electrochemical, physical functions of our body and brain, and, and perhaps shed some light, pun intended, on the, spirit, on the spiritual to material interactions. I would like to suggest that before we get into this um, really fairly complex uh, topic, that we just take a moment to calm our minds, because calm minds are an extremely important part of the process. To be able to trust in the process and in the in the worshipful nature of problem solving, you don't worship in a frenetic manner. You worship in a calm manner. And perhaps with that calmness, we can glimpse the complexity of, of life carriers and mother's handiwork. So everybody just take a deep breath and calm. Thank you. I need that more than more than you do. Um, and keep in mind that this is this is Jeff Taylor's research, and coupled with my own mental gymnastics. And I may make statements throughout this presentation that sound like I'm stating facts. And while the science is supported by um, by research, the speculative extrapolations are strictly mine and always open to questioning, criticism, correction, refinement. Um, it is a work in process, as am I. So. Spiritual influences are likely involving all of the cells of our body and, and dominant in the serotonin vagus nerve systems. Um, because one of the things unique about microtubules is that they're in every cell of your body that has your DNA. So it's got your characteristic DNA stamp on it. It's got microtubules. But we're going to focus primarily on the brain and its associated functions. And, and now we got to talk about 
what's brain? Well, brain is sort of the tangible part of the body. And how do we differentiate that from mind? Mind, I differentiate as the more overarching consciousness of the brain's activity. So it's an intangible. So behind the scenes, the brain has pre prioritized memories. It's sorted them out into, into um, prioritized actions or prioritized places, positions. And then the mind actively prioritizes those memory associations for conscious activities. So think of it sort of pre-poised and the mind just makes certain things available. Um, so it's like a 3D tapestry that if you align it just way, you can see a certain picture, you align it another way, you can see another picture. So let's differentiate first consciousness from mindfulness. Consciousness is where we're mentally and emotionally attentive to our physiological states, our physical sensations created by the external world. Whereas mindfulness involves a deliberate focus on the consciousness it emphasizes acceptance and openness and whatever arises in that conscious awareness and its environment. So it's the observer observing the observer, so to speak. Having said that, let's look at consciousness. And th there are essentially eight states of consciousness. We've got unconsciousness, where you've got a disrupted connectivity to the brain stem. Um, there's subconsciousness a pre-established state of the brain uh, and input control mechanisms. And, and, and there's this unique little state of consciousness called hypnagogia, where you're just falling asleep. So you're between wakefulness and sleep. There's this state called hypnagogia. And it's a potentially creative thing that we could pay attention to uh, once we realize that there's some potential for spiritual interaction in that state. Now there's light, quiet sleep, and here the hypothalamus uh, input mechanisms are shut down, so your, your brain is, is working internally. Then there's rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, your active dream state, and there's an interesting uh, phenomenon. In that active dream state, your thermostasis regulation is shut down. So you might get hot or cold, and that happens in the, in the rapid eye movement stage and that influences your dream state. Now there's also deep sleep. That's where you're in the delta wave, very low frequency. Uh, this is where the immune system can fix things because it doesn't have to pay attention to what's going on. It has a body repairing mechanism going on in deep state, uh, deep sleep. It's also where the brain uh, is so quiet and the blood flow is so limited that the blood vessels supplying the brain are are allowing space so that the crap can come out the the uh, tau particles and uh, the junk from thinking all day can sneak out through the through the skull uh, there's no lymph system in the brain so you have to have that deep sleep to clean out the the brain cavity now there's wakefulness that's the sort of normal active uh, what we call the beta wave uh, 12 to 40 hertz dominant Free will thinking state. That's the only one of the states in, in this eight states that we actually get to play with actively. And then your actual book would add the eighth state, which is the super consciousness state. So that's the, the kind of pre prioritized brain activity that's not overtly involved in input analysis or executive functioning and decision making, but it's pre wired for that. So that's our potentially God conscious state. So higher. A higher state of thinking. Um, this is a, a very hot scientific topic. So uh, ever since the 1600s, they've been trying to define what the heck is consciousness. And there are um, seven top rated consciousness theories. And I'll, I'll just briefly list them. Uh, there's integrated information theory. Uh, consciousness is a web of information. There's higher order theories, the hot theory, which is consciousness as self-reflection. There's biological naturalism, which is consciousness as a biologically natural phenomenon. There's panpsychism, 
consciousness as a fundamental property. And in, in other words, all physical entities from electrons to galaxies possess some form of consciousness or proto-consciousness. Then there's Darwinian uh, or neural Darwinism uh, theory of consciousness. And it's a kind of a process of natural selection. So the evolution of consciousness, conscious emerging from the natural process of selection within the brain. There's global workspace theory. Consciousness is a general information clearing hub. And there's the one that we're going to talk about today and one I'm, I'm most familiar or most excited about. It's called quantum consciousness. So the quantum consciousness theory or the quantum mind theory is a theory based on the ideas that microtubules, which are these tiny little protein structures found in the DNA or found in, found in cells that have our DNA, can facilitate quantum level coherences. So quantum consciousness works best with my sort of causality thinking, sort of your answer book causality thinking, and um, as, as kind of the mediator between matter and spirit. So let's look at um, the fundamental uh, piece of this quantum coherence theory of consciousness. Okay, so here is a cell, and uh, we've got in between the cells, and actually a structural part of the cell, are these things called microtubules. And they're tiny cylinders, about 20 nanometers in diameter, and just for human for, for reference purposes, a human hair cell is 100,000 nanometers. So these are tiny little uh, things that help the structure, the basic structure of the cell. And they connect the cells, join the cells together, and they're part of the skeletal structure of the cell. So they, they help with the structure of the cell. They talk, they move things between cells. They move organelles between cells. They also facilitate separation of the chromosomes during cell division in, in mitosis. So they're, um, you know, very much need to talk to neighboring cells. And, and they do that in a, in a very unique way. They have these 13 stacks or filaments um, that are built from one end, from the positively charged end, and they disperse from the negatively charged other end. And that's how they grow and shrink on a continuous basis, moment by moment. This doesn't happen over, over long periods of time. Minute by minute, these changes are occurring. Um, this is actually an actual photograph. Um, the white are the microtubules and the red are the, are the chromosomes. So here, the microtubules are actually assisting in the cell division. And, and they're actually looking at working with the microtubules as a part of a cancer uh, cure mechanism. So understanding the cell division when the cancer cells are, are uh, dividing uh, may be a way to uh, deal with, the, with cancers. They, they can be as short as, as um, a, a micrometer, very small, and as long as 50 micrometers or micrometers in, an, in a dynamically unstable process. So they're constantly changing, and it's called treadmilling. Technically, it's, it's adding these, um, these triphosphates in a hydrolysis mechanism. But where the individual lumps, the individual proteins on each of these 13 strands, which are called dimers, um, are lost at the negative end and built up on the positive end at the uh, center, what they call a centrosome end. So 13 of these uh, filaments, um, joined but different, uh, arranged in parallel form in a circular tube with salt water filled cavity and they have a distinct electrical polarity. In other words, each of the dimers has a positive end and a negative end, and they can generate an internally consistent, meaning that they are not influenced by their surroundings, self-sustaining electromagnetic field. And collectively, these, uh, these insulated tubes don't talk to their surrounding tubes. They just talk to each other. 
in in an isolated manner that buys them 10 to the minus six seconds before they get short circuit, before they get uh, the electrical charge dis dissipated. We're, we're constantly uh, a combination of resistance and capacitance and discharging and building. Um, here's a couple more pictures. <clears throat> the little strings you see between the, the towers um, are what they call microtubule assisted proteins. And they do more cross pollinating of the electrical charges as they go between these uh, um, microtubules. And looking at one of those little pills that makes up the tube, the filaments, are these tubulin dimers. So in the very small uh, things you're looking at now, the protein, one individual tubulin dimer. It's a complex little guy. Um, now some more pictures. There's, there's these actins and there's septins uh, that also, you know, sort of like glue to hold these things, uh, make them stable. And these are actual pictures of, of those septins and actins that are sort of with the microtubules overlapping and co-localizing with them um, to facilitate this electrical crosstalk. So it's a massively uh, cross-correlated uh, cross electrical mechanism. And it's in every cell in your body that has your DNA. And this lengthening and shortening is uh, is going on all the time. You're controlling it by your thoughts and actions, by your calmness and your and your frenetic nature, um, assisted by these other uh, mechanisms. The interesting thing about these microtubules is that they have resonant frequencies. So as the as the electrical pulses transition down these filaments they resonate at four ranges and this is where we we get the overlap of the mechanical and the spiritual in my opinion kilohertz the low frequency end megahertz the medium frequency gigahertz and terahertz and i can give you this the specific frequencies here but really we're talking about mechanical vibration frequencies, infrared frequencies, and there's even two frequencies up in the ultraviolet. In the infrared, it's heat. In the mechanical, it's jiggling. The molecules jiggle or the material actually moves in the mechanical vibrations. The infrared is heat, so warming up and cooling down. But the interesting one is the ultraviolet. That's in the electron jump range. So the electrons are jumping up and down, and they're doing that at two very specific frequencies. And those um, form, in my opinion, a possible uh, quantum mechanism where we can interface with other things. This is a, an image now of the mechanical vibration modes of these microtubules. And you can see there's... Um, seven modes of mechanical vibration. So the tubes are wiggling in these, uh, just like a guitar string uh, vibrating mechanically. So what do we care? Why, why do we care about microtubules and, and how they're working in the in the day-to-day -day functioning of them? And it's because our thoughts have biological consequences. If you think about it, if you get really annoyed with somebody, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, you're changing your short-term physiology. And that's no different than all of your thinking processes are, are changing your microtubule lengths. Typically, the calmer, more um, reflective you are, and, and the Yerantia book says, you know, remain for a time in silent reflectivity. Well, that's calming and growing your microtubules. Uh, so, in in uh, in one ten, it says to the mind of perfect poise, hounded, housed in a body of clean habits, stabilized neural energies, and balanced chemical functions. When the physical, mental, and spiritual powers are in triune harmony, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and microtubules later on. But just think about everything has got to be in, in that balance. So if, if your microtubules are short, 
there's very little time between sensory input and output. And if hate makes the trip faster than uh, love, <laughs> then guess what thoughts are going to arrive first? Um, if there's calm, reflective, it's the reflective stuff that's going to arrive uh, with more with more control. Um, but let's bring this back now to um, the quantum coherence concept. Quantum coherence only happens at the subatomic levels. It doesn't happen at the mechanical level. So in our in our physiology, there's this is one of the very few mechanisms where we can have quantum coherence. In other words, we can have um, a mechanism in these microtubules that allows for quantum coherence. We'll get to that in a little bit more detail later on, but it's because of the bioluminescent cascade mechanism down each of those filaments and those specific resonant frequencies um, allows us, allows the microtubules themselves to cohere with neighboring microtubules and in a kind of a collapse of the wave function locally in your in your brain, the thought collapses. So the, the microtubules are poised with certain patterning and a thought collapses those microtubule um, electrical discharges and the thought emerges or the cross um, communication of this cells emerges. So in the microtubule, we've got the mechanical functioning and the optical functioning. And this may be where we delicately touch the marantia cells and other spiritual influences, because that's where they can play in this, in this quantum coherence mode. So it, it's my supposition that marantia is more of an optical nature. So if you think of low frequency as us, material, Marantia as optical, perhaps midway or it's operated in the ultraviolet and above uh, optical ranges. Uh, the the, the Marantia material is uh, essentially what the um, current scientists call hard light. Under certain conditions, you can make light behave like an atom or behave like a molecule. So it's possible to make light behave like atoms and molecules. And I'm sure the the life carriers uh, and the master physical controllers are, are doing that to create the Marancho uh, material uh, overlap. So, uh, you know, and just some other suppositions on my part, perhaps by bio, the bioluminescence of these microtubules may have been why Adam and Eve gave forth a shimmer of light if they had more prominent or more predominant microtubules. It could have been that, you know, the Adamic up, uplift would have given us more dominant microtubules. It could be that the bioluminescence of microtubules is, is hinting at the term pilot light. Um, it could be that that light of truth, you know, all those terms to uh, spiritual luminescence suddenly have a different meaning if you realize that there is a part of your anatomy that does respond in that quantum and manageable uh, light um, coherence capability. Uh, 111 says human consciousness rests gently on the electrochemical mechanism below and delicately touches the spirit Marantia energy system above. So again, it could be that electromagnetic continuum, uh, which we see uh, in the microtubule. So let's, let's delve a little bit deeper into uh, the microtubule mechanism. Each of the the filaments has two types of dimers, two of the little cells, A dimers and B dimers. And the individual cells make up the filaments and they have electromagnetic energies in each one. And this optical coherence uh, of the wave, basically each one starts an electrical a bioluminescence and triggers the next one, which triggers a bioluminescence, which triggers the next one. And so these, these um, bioluminescence cascade down the, the microtubules, uh, and, and that buys us the delay of the communication in a phenomenon called superradiance. 
meaning that they not only go around the rings this way, they go up the tubes that way. Um, and so this is this is how we get the time between the, the sensory input and, and our understanding of that sensory input. The patterns and their connectedness, assisted by all those other um, things I talked about earlier, actins and, and microtubule-assisted proteins and things, create nodes. And this whole thing it forms an orchestra of interactions. And it's they've coined the term orchestrated objective reduction, OOR. And since the dimers are, are on top of each other, as well as being in a helical rings, their interactions at the quantum level, meaning the, the, the multiple positions at, at the same time, um, form qubits. What's a qubit? A qubit is an interaction that can be simultaneously in two places and can be an infinite number of places in between those two places. So quantum computers work in qubits as opposed to binary computers which work in zeros and ones. So essentially in our microtubules we have the ability to function as qubits because of this mechanism, this construction, this circular and, and tubular uh, nature. So qubits, quantum oscillating dipoles. Um, these oscillating interactions are, are both mechanical and those wiggly low frequency and uh, in the optical frequencies in the electron jump uh, and nuclear spin uh, frequencies. So that's this orchestra is really patternable by us and may be influenced uh, at the at the coherence, the quantum coherence level, both locally in the brain and perhaps at larger distances, for example, with the adjutant spirits, with, with the uh, um, absolutes, you know, the universal absolute, the deity absolute. Um, one of the interesting things about quantum coherences is that the, the tiny part is a part of the whole and can be influenced by the whole. That's what quantum means. So entanglement, uh, superposition, um, collapse of the wave function, all of those terms you know are associated with quantum physics can now be applied to these microtubules. If you think about um, an animal reacts immediately to the sensory input, we have the ability of time these tubules give us time between the input and our reaction. So it's a little like adding a fragment of eternity in our temporality. So uh, up to a half a second or 500 milliseconds as these influences cascade down the, down the filaments. And that's what gives us the time to observe our observations. We get an input from vision or auditory or tactile or something like that. And this biases the time before we react. 112 says, true spiritual experience is the experiential realization of the cosmic reality of the observation of the observation of all this relative synthesis of energy materials of time and space. So they're all hinting at many places that it's, it's the marriage of the physical and the, and the spiritual. So these microtubules, which are in all your cell, are most noticeably functional in the medial temporal lobe of the brain as facilitators of cross communication. You know, the thought adjusters are called thought changers when we're a child. What's the difference between a child brain and, and an adult brain? The big difference is the myelin sheath on the nerves. The child brain doesn't have myelin sheaths on the nerve. It's still very much cross-pollinating all of its thoughts all of the time. We develop those preconceived notions and ways of doing things. We know exactly how to move our hand. We know exactly how to run, those sorts of things. That, those are facilitated by the myelin sheath on the nerve endings, which make our thinking very much faster and very much more fixed. What the microtubules do is they give you back that cross-pollination capability, but now it's free will controlled. 
you can control the length of your microtubules and the cross-pollination of your thinking. So you still know how to move your hand, but you can you can broaden the um, cross-pollination of your thoughts. I mentioned at the quantum level that individual things act as an aspect of the whole. That's the nature of quantum, the very definition. Uh, the very de of, definition of the part is it is that function of the whole. And as the Ranch Book readers, if we consider the supreme as the whole, then our quantum level experiences are part of the whole or influenced by the whole. So probabilistic quantum level coherences, uh, timelessness of spiritual energy, time simultaneity, uh, being in two places at one time, tunneling, quantum tunneling, quantum entanglement where things are uh, uh, tangled at a distance. We know it's happening locally in the brain. It may be happening spiritually influenced um, by the uh, adjutants or the um, Holy Spirit or the absolutes, unqualified, universal. So microtubules essentially hold a state. They're there all the time and they're poised until the observation or the measurement is made. The, you know, you're trying to remember something. And then at that point, they they fire, they collapse. So they they collapse from a from a definite state and form the thought. And quantum entanglement, if if we are aware of it, means that we're involving the whole in that collapse of the wave function or in that generation of the thought. We can think locally in the brain, but we might be influenced over vast distances, maybe even all the way to paradise. And our, our microtubules allow for that interface. And if you think about it, um, what they says in, what it says in, in um, paper two, the far-flung physical universe coheres in the Isle of Paradise. The intellectual universe coheres in the God of Mind. The conjoint actor, the spiritual universe, is coherent in the personality of the eternal son. Man's jester is a fragment of God and everlastingly seeks divine unification. It coheres with and in the paradise deities of the first source and center. So, again, they're talking about coherences at all the physical and mindal and spiritual levels. And the microtubules have a mechanism where they can facilitate that. So let's put this in the overall electromagnetic spectrum continuum um, ideas. As the Uranus book says, light, heat, electro electricity, ma magnetism, chemism, energy, and matter in nature, origin, and destiny are all the same thing. So let's look at that. Well, according to the Uranus book, there's 100 octaves in our local universe, and science has figured out about 81 of them. And if you think about those electrically uh, electromagnetic octaves uh, going from very low frequencies, and then in the middle there's the, the visible light frequencies, and at the higher frequencies there's um, X-rays, gamma rays. At the, at the lower frequencies there's mechanical microwave radio waves and the, and the physical movement frequencies. But each, if, if you want to have an influence, you have to sort of match the frequency. The, the uh, low frequencies can't affect gamma rays, and, and gamma rays can't affect the low frequencies. Um, you just have to match frequencies in order to have some influence. And the microtubules allow that uh, optical uh, interference or, or influence to be rippled down into the mechanical. So if you think about uh, the range, the thought adjuster is probably up in the 10 to the 24th uh, hertz range, so up, way up in the high frequency range, and we're down in the, in the kilohertz range. Um, and his job, his task, is to figure out how to whistle a tune at 10 to the 24 hertz that we can hear in the in the kilohertz range, um, and microtubules might be one of those mechanisms. And as they say, the thought adjusters would like to change your feelings of fear to to convictions of love, and they can't do that mechanically or arbitrarily. 
uh, that's our task. So we have to make the decisions that deliver us from fear and supply that physical fulcrum for the adjuster. So we got to give them long enough tubules to to work with um, and provide that function. And I'd like to talk for a moment now about the spirit of truth. What actually happened at Pentecost? If you think about the Adamic uplift, it was a biological uplift, gave our DNA a, a boost, made us more capable. I think what happened at Pentecost is that we had another physiological uplift in that we grow, grew our two wheels. And if you think about it, what was Jesus doing when he was here? He was learning how to pattern his mind to be most receptive to Father's influence. He was growing his microtubules. He was always calm, never frenetic. He was growing his tubules. He was figuring out the perfect patterning of those microtubules. So our job now it, then is to pattern our own microtubules in a Christ-like manner. That's what I think uh, the spirit of truth. When you change your mind or invoke the mind of Jesus, you're temporarily at least saying, I want to I want to think like Jesus. I want my pattern of thinking to be more like like Jesus would be thinking. And 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 having experienced material life, he would have a good idea, since he created the life carriers in the first place, that um uh, how the patterning should be from the inside out. So, if we can temporarily facilitate Christ-like thinking, and we can do that more and more repetition, we can build up a kind of a homostatic norm of thinking more and more like, like Jesus thought, and make, make that the base from which we do our thinking. And there's a very interesting quote in uh, paper 52 that says, the spirit of truth is a fact as well as a truth. And that implies to me that there is some physiology which is actual fact as well as it, as the truth of its function in our in our bodies. So just to end this uh, presentation, I'd, I'd like to thank a few people uh, for reviewing my uh, IC23 paper. Um, Bernie Gingras, uh, Richard Rosen, um, Byron Belitzos, uh, to name a few. Uh, so a lot of people have helped me along the way. And uh, and one of the most famous sayings is uh, Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am. And I'd like to amend that slightly and make it, I think, coherently. <laughs> and with the help of my microtubules, therefore I am. And I would add dot, 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 and I will be for an eternity. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, it, uh, that was a lot, but it, uh, very interesting. And oh, look, we've already got lots of hands. Um, David Henry, uh, you're up. All of this really makes a lot of sense to me. But there was something that really puzzled me when I first started reading the Arantia book. And that was uh, a real curiosity that when our thought adjusters, should they leave us and go travel to paradise, and return to us, they don't travel on spiritual circuits. They travel on the material circuits. So that's a, that was that just fascinated me. And everything that you just presented really kind of begins to give us at least a framework to start to make sense of the mechanisms of actually how this works. The Arantia, I, I love I love what the Revelators did. Uh, I, I, they threw in some humor. They they say that they, our thought adjuster can leave us and go to paradise, except, I don't know, something ridiculous. Like they stop at the center of our, uh, uh, of our super universe uh, uh, and uh, they spend 117 hours, so and so minutes and seconds there. <laughs> it's like this... this they really give us a lot of material for 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 uh, you know making jokes about that you know you know what's what what's been keeping you what do they do when they're talking to the ancients of days it's like really funny anyway thanks for your presentation it was really it was really good very good yeah I think I think thought adjusters operate outside of time or at least on the gravity circuits 
Um, so more of an instantaneous uh, capability, yeah. Thanks, so, um, Vincent. I'm just amazed at the variety of thought that various people have when they read the Eventual. I mean, it's not really one thought, it's just this multiple thought. And you know, you talk non-locality and all of that. And Susan, I hope to see you over there. You're not sitting next to him, but you and him are the yin and the yang of the Urantia place here. You have to be, you're entangled. And um, there's the physical and the spiritual and you guys are one. I just wanted to comment on that. As I said before, I'm still three years only into the Urantia book. Um, but, you know, what you started to say reminded me of the books by Robert Lanz on biocentrism and that everything out there in existence is consciousness and he goes into biology of that sort of built in. But I, um, a lot to think about um, in this aspect. I, I just wanted to thank you for it and hope some of it got through. Anyway, that was it. My, my pleasure. And and yes, Susan and I are very complementary. Yeah, because we don't think exactly the same, we can uh, you know see things from both perspectives. I I like to think of the male femaleness in the Urantia book as specificity and ubiquity. You know, the female being, you know everywhere or the uh, mother spirit being everywhere and the and the uh, michael spirit or the personality being very localized and if you think about it i i tend to zoom in on things and and focus on them and and she sort of keeps the big picture and the connectedness picture so it it, it is very complimentary thank you thanks interesting um roy you're next um, this is this was great stuff. I really want to learn some more about this. But I have a kind of a three part. First of all, the Adamic uplift. How does that affect the situation, given that we didn't get the full booster, <laughs> the booster shot? Um, second, how do how will um, uh, modern medical um, chemicals and things that we need to take for various illnesses. I'm diabetic, so I need, um, you know, I need to take medicine and all kinds of other stuff around it. Um, and third, um, are, you, are you teaching this as a course somewhere? Um, can I sign up somewhere? This is, this was great. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, no, I'm not teaching it. But I am uh, uh, speaking to the medical. I am. I'm working on a on a, a watch that uh, detects the electromagnetic activity uh, under the skin, um, and it, primarily for detecting glucose levels or the uh, the metabolism related to glucose levels. So I'm very aware of of diabetes and uh, and the related uh, metabolic functions. Um, so we can have a conversation about that. Uh, feel free to send me an email, and we can we can talk more about at least type two diabetes and the and the physiology of that mechanism. And right. you asked about the endemic uplift. I think uh, you know we we were supposed to get a, a a biologic uplift, or essentially putting more gene variants in the DNA strand to work with. Because basically, um, evolution requires that we uh, rearrange the genes in such fashion, and they're you know they're just GCTAs. So um, the permutations and combinations of those genes are what make the variations. And I think the endemic uplift was going to give us more uh, potentials for different combinations. What we're going because we didn't get the full complement of uh, endemic biologic uplift. We're going to have to do on our own with uh, CRISPR technology, where we can define the desirable elements of the gene. And for things like cystic fibrosis, we can identify which genes need to be uh, removed. We do have some uh, abilities in the epigenetic modifications. Epigenetics allows you to mark genes. If, if you take the gene, uh, the DNA strand, and, and string it out, you can mark certain elements of the genes 
by the way you think, by the way you react. And that when the when the thing folds the next time and makes a new protein, will fold slightly differently. So you can influence your physiology in the way that you react. Uh, if you're constantly angry or, or constantly loving, those become more and more um, the way you uh, your physiology changes. So um, that's great. I'll keep working on that part. <laughs> well, we're all thank working. You. On it. Yeah, thank yes. you. I will contact you. Uh, thanks so much. That's excellent. Be my guess. Yeah, it's it's peace in this life, perfection in the next. So don't expect perfection in this one. Thank you, um, Peter. I have a question for you that's kind of different, I think, than 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 what you just presented because I I you know I do have some ideas uh, reg regarding uh, some things regarding circles and circuits that help mm -hmm. me understand how we connect and how we're not connecting as well as we should be uh, with the uh, with with uh, um, uh, let's just call it divine spirits around us. But um, uh, I I hear you you're saying that. You know, you were a Catholic there for a while, and you stopped that because you had a, um, a, a an intellectual disagreement with the the um, spiritual approach that they took. Um, and of course, all these books later, you know, uh, we have a, pre a presentation that they've given us that I find when people that are in the Yorancy community say that they 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 don't like Catholics or they don't like that perspective, they do that from more of an emotional perspective as opposed to an intellectual one which i believe you're representing but i've got to ask the question and if it's if it's an answer that maybe i already heard because roy asked about the adamic uplift which might be the answer i don't think so but it might be um as a person who's watched this happen both historically and scientifically perhaps and perhaps even intellectually you have a, maybe a read in on it looking back 1993 years ago um in april when when Pentecost took place, where where the Spirit uh, came down uh, as a result of Jesus' presence here, um, what what could they have done different back then to take that fourth epical revelation and get us closer to where we need to be, or is that even should there have always been a fifth, nineteen hundred years later? Anyway, I don't want to load up the question. But please, if it's too, you know, if it's something you haven't thought about, I want to know what you what you think about that particularly. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of microtubules, I think Pentecost was a, a, a patterning and perhaps a lengthening of microtubules. So that gave uh, the apostles and anyone else who knew Jesus um, a sense of what it would be like to be Jesus-like. And... And, you know, the question was, how then do they apply this feeling? And, and really, if you, it, to be Jesus-like is to be God-like, because Jesus was trying to be God-like. So they're trying to be Jesus-like. The best they could think of at the time, or the most exciting thing they could think of at the time, was his resurrection. If, if being Jesus-like is to be resurrected, I want to be resurrected. I want everyone to be resurrected, and then they focused on the resurrection. So I think they misapplied the spirit of truth early uh, to what sells easiest. Resurrection was an easy sell. Beatitudes, uh, inevitabilities, um, you know, hum happier those who mourn, those are more tough sells than don't worry about anything, you're going to resurrect. Um, and everything is going to be fine. Is a much easier sell. So I think the zeal of the spirit of truth, which comes from this feeling Christ-like, was just a little bit misdirected. And it, it, I wasn't Catholic. I was Catholic without the smoke. It's called Anglican. Mm -hmm. Understood. Marian. Marian. The Arantia book discusses the pituitary and the pineal gland. Now, in my personal worship experience, and, and perhaps I have been misinterpreting this and it has more to do with what you've been discussing today, but I feel like those chemicals 
from that part of my brain, those part of my enzyme system or um, what have you, hormone system, all of those, gets released because it's a feeling experience. Now, maybe it's because I'm a female and I'm more the feeling part of uh, the universe. I feel like I get totally changed chemically when I'm in a deep worship state. And the book does talk a little bit about the pineal and pituitary gland. Is this something that the thought adjuster releases to us? Do you think? Well, really, the, the, the pineal and pituitary are hormone generating glands, uh, along with the, the, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, um, and a few others. And the Urantia book talks about, you know, I think 15,000 or something. Uh, yeah, 15 million chemical reactions between the hormone output of dozen duct dust glands. The interesting thing about the uh, the pineal gland is its light sensitivity. There's some uh, sense of, of light sensitivity to that pineal gland. So it may be another one of the mechanisms where light influence can uh, trigger a hormonal response. Um, the pineal gland is also related to melatonin output. So that's a very calming uh, sleep um, motivating or deep sleep motivating uh, hormone uh, that again may help thought adjuster communication mechanism put you into that uh, super conscious malleable uh, sleep state. So um, there, there's also, you know, the the drugs, uh, DMT um, and uh, psilocybin. Um, psilocybin? Oh, yeah. Yeah, psilocybin. And there's a bunch of them. They're very similar uh, physiologically or, or patterned very similarly. And they're basically serotonin mimicking drugs. So they're called the spirit molecules or the spirit drugs uh, because they do this uh, whole body Cross communication uh, mechanism, so they they trigger that thing, and the pineal gland is also sort of capable of that uh, cross pollination of of uh, of thinking. So it's a it's a very interesting concept, and and microtubules are certainly only a part of the bigger picture. I'm sure that they're giving it <clears throat> as many uh, possibilities as possible. But yeah, they're they're definitely in the equation. What yeah. one of the things that that's helped me personally uh, is the Urantia book says that uh, we should surrender the worship to the thought adjuster. And I think by doing that, you know, you're getting, you're, you're surrendering your ego for one thing and you're asking God to take over. And then he does whatever these, all of these different things that are necessary for our connection with him. And so that that's that's worked for me. I was I had a very unique spiritual experience. I was uh, diagnosed with a terminal illness and at a very, very spiritual Celtic conference, I felt uh, a beam of light penetrate my crown chakra and fill every cell of my body. I assumed that I still had this disease for many years and kept taking the medicine. Until my, recently, my physician said, you would be dead by now, Marion, if you had that disease. We're going to do all new tests. And turns out, I didn't have it anymore. And I keep thinking back to that moment when every cell of my body became light. And, you know, if you can imagine a hundred bagpipes, a choir, an orchestra, uh, singing. I mean, it was just with a thousand people in the same wavelength listening to the deer's cry. If you all look it up, the deer's cry is one of the most spiritual pieces of music that I've ever heard. And it just transformed me psychologically, but it must have also transformed me physiologically. Yeah, we definitely have the ability the ability to transform our physiology, and and the emotional response is a very big driver in that uh, in that transformation process. So, 
uh, and the calming that comes with that sense of uh, downrush is, is a big part of it, in my opinion. Good term, Thank downrush. You. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Marion. That's a, that's a great story. And thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jody. Um, since uh, the utilization of our higher thinking is really the foundation of growing these microtubules, um, can you give us just some cliff notes, um, some things to start considering now? Some sure. tools that you found helpful? Sure. I got a list of... Uh, of 15 of them, I think this, your body supports your mind, your attitudes, thoughts, emotions, and, re and actions and reactions change your electrochemical nature and spirit receptivity. receptivity. So these are the things you have, you have to be aware of. Be slow in your responses, be open and thoughtful to reflective change. Have childlike faith because childlike faith gives you that calm, you know, sort of somebody else has got my back kind of attitude, trust in God, but with adult-like focus, um, creatively leap from a stable, calm confidence in God's plan. Uh, and remember that where your thoughts go, energy flows. So if you're always thinking about the hate that's in the world and the, and the trouble and the torment, that's where your energy will, will go. Um, the physical to physiological link is bi-directional. Your body supports how you feel. You can control how your body feels. You know, it's a reciprocal arrangement. Uh, emotions make epigenetic modifications to your genes on a moment-by-moment, -moment, instant by instant basis. So you you keep control of your emotions and you will con keep control of uh, of your incremental improvement mechanism. Uh, let's see. Align your thinking from a top-down perspective. So think eternally, act temporally. Um, let paradise be your stable reference, knowing that it doesn't change at all. And, um, let your thought adjuster be your time reference, because he's essentially outside of time. Invert your thinking to be the, the Jesus inversion. You know, happy are they that mourn. So every time you have a challenge, think of it as an opportunity to grow. We, we grow wisdom more from challenges, more from difficulty than we do from bliss states. So another one. Stay cool, calm, and collected because your microtubules can only function in a, in a narrow um, temperature range. If you get the temperature of microtubules too warm, i.e. in a fever, they stop functioning. They short circuit, basically. So that's why you don't think well uh, with um, when, you, when you have a fever or, or a lack of homeostasis. So uh, good deep sleep or worship. Both have the same delta wave, meditative, low frequency, calming, uh, influence giving the thought adjusters sort of maximum uh, opportunity to interact. And what do I say? Be still and know that the mother's processes guiding us to find father are unfolding as they should. Um, Matt, you're next. 2005, uh, the inventor and futurist Ray Kurzweil wrote a book called The Singularity is Near and he proposed that uh, a point would come in the future when AI, robots, and genetic technology would transform the ability of humans to uh, be in charge of their own destinies uh, and the uh, biology of the planet would be transcended. How do you feel about that, Jeff? I think AI used properly could be appropriate. I don't think it will be used properly, just like every other technology we have, we tend to misuse. Um, AI doesn't promote innovation, it promotes hindsight. So it will uh, force us to be lazier and lazier. We'll just have AI do our thinking for us. We'll have the marketers 
do our buying for us um, based on our previous preferences. So the problem with AI, as I see it, is because it's it's retrospective, always looking back, and very much a function of the data base that it's looking at. Um, it's only as good as vetting of the database, and and surprise, surprise, the vetting of the database is given to other AI mechanisms. <laughs> so it, it has it's fraught with its own issues, um, and I think the the most dangerous one is being uh, lazy in our thinking. It AI is not moral. Um, it's just reflective. And looking back, we weren't that moral. <laughs> We're still not that moral. So if AI reflects that immorality, it could be a problem. But uh, combined with genetics and robots, uh, Kurzweil proposes that the singularity will create a being that actually is superior to the human mind. How do you feel about that? The genetics and robots combining with the AI to do all this called the singularity. Yep. It's supposed yeah. to happen. They propose it's happening, going to happen in 2035. Some people say 2052. My claim is that it's already occurred. Yeah, the the the, the term singularity is a, is an interesting one. I, I don't uh, I can't bring that into the equation, but but certainly with CRISPR, we're able to affect genes that sort of determines the, you know, you could theoretically improve the physiology of the, of the people. Um, is there moral associations with that? Well, there should be, will there be? I don't know. So yes, we have the ability to create robots there with the combination of artificial intelligence and, and robotic control can make them uh, very believable. Um, so, yeah, we're in for a, a very interesting future here. And if we're looking at the sort of resolution of the Lucifer Rebellion, uh, we have to take that um, selfishness to its extreme to show, to demonstrate to the other planets that it really doesn't work that well. Um, but if there's a few of us on the planet that can say that cooperation is uh, is way better than individualism, that God is real, and if, if we go with his plan, it's much more lasting eternally than the individualistic, uh, self-centered approach. You know, but they've got to let it play out to the end. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Matt. Good uh, question. Um, David, if you don't mind, I'm going to skip you and put you at the end, since uh, so make sure we have time for everybody, but keep your hand up. Uh, Sean, do you want to go next? Energy and gravity. Um, physicists, we obviously can measure both of those things, but physics, no physicist or anyone really understands the essence. What is, what is energy? What is gravity? We know from the Urantia book that the source, we know, we understand the source of both of those things. In terms of the various quantum theories that are out there, you got Bohm's carrier wave, the wave collapse, super string theory, information theory. Which do you adhere to or believe in the most? Or do you think they're just different lenses into the same reality? I don't necessarily subscribe to any one theory of anything. I like to read all theories and, and sort of make up my own uh, you know, combined theory. Um, energy is is the most interesting uh, thing in the universe because it it is the it is eternal. Um, energy can be neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be changed in its form. Uh, in multiple ways. So that to me says, well, we've established eternity. Now the question is, is there a pattern or is there a pattern to that energy? Um, and I think there's two kinds of patterns. One is the, is the gravity pattern, i.e. the material pattern. And then there's the spiritual pattern of that energy. So 
meanings and values, mass and emotion. And 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 really what we're what we are is in the mind game trying to understand the connection between matter and motion and um this this spiritual patterning or the meanings and values. And then one other question to follow up. There's a reference in the Urantia book that there's another type of energy that hasn't been discovered. The book was released in the 30s, and you know there was the uh, atomic uh, bomb created. I don't know if that's the same reference or not, or maybe there's something else. It could be. It it could be the weak force. Um, it could be fusion uh, as opposed to f uh, fission. You know, um, those are two forms of energy that were not, you know, maybe speculated on, but um, they may be. But there may be. Um, a, uh, a coherence energy, an energy of coherence. In other words, if you are <clears throat> actively trying to uh, align wills with God's will, that's probably the path of least resistance. And that's probably the, the most um, logical path to follow. If you're putting a lot of energy into it, it's probably because you're trying to do something other than God's will. Uh, you're fighting God's will. So there may be um, an interface between material energy and spiritual energy, which is sort of trying to align um, that those things which um, make things flow nicely. That said, we don't learn much when things are flowing nicely. We learn more. Uh, we become wiser in challenges and difficulties. So we have to realize that that um, if if meanings and values are most important, then we we don't want to back away from challenges where we would learn some meanings and develop some values. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, David, um, go ahead, and then we'll get to you, Andre. So David first. Uh, I'm glad you men mentioned uh, CRISPR. <laughs> uh, I I'm very, very concerned about CRISPR. Um, I real, I'm just going to come out and say it. Uh, I don't think we have any business going in and altering the human DNA. Uh, the revelators were kind enough to tell us that uh, there's most likely going to be a return of Adam and Eve or their children. So whatever genetic shortcomings we may have, our celestial overseers uh, will see to that. Uh, I have all the confidence in that. Uh, well, CRISPR, I think if if CRISPR, I have a, a friend, close friend that's uh, cystic fibrosis, and if they can fix cystic fibrosis with a gene, I'm a carrier of cystic fibrosis. If they can fix that with a CRISPR gene modification, I'm all for it. Uh, I I do think it has the potential, like any other um, mechanism, to be destructive. I think that um, they they no longer call uh, it junk DNA. They're seeing that the repetitions are uh, influencing the way the gene folds. Um, and when you put the um, epigenetic histone tags on, there's four different mechanisms. They do involve the, those repetitions of, of gene sequences that they control the way the gene folds, which controls the protein that it makes. So they don't think of it as junk DNA anymore, and they wouldn't be doing that unless they were doing this uh, extrapolation. One of the interesting things that they are working on is the telomeres that are on the ends of the genes. Uh, as we age, they shorten, and when they get to no more telomeres, the gene starts to go wrong. You, you, you develop wrinkles and lose hair and things like that. So CRISPR could add lengths telomere links to things which would bias life that might be akin to the endemic uh, gene uplift may have been longer telomeres they lived 300 400 years uh, we might be able to with crispr modifications or things that enhance that keep the telomeres long and gain extra time to gain the wisdom we need in order to use the crispr appropriately <laughs> Thanks. Uh, good topic. Uh, probably the last uh, question, Andre. As you said, Jeff, using my Miko 
turbulence. Uh, I I'm very happy that uh, you touch the science field with equilibrium, with religion and philosophy. It's very a plus. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And Thanks, it, is, it is all necessary. You, a part of the problem with science these days is that they focus on the science. And it's, a, it's not a God-centric science. It's a material-centered science. We have to put God back in the science picture. And I think one of the things the science faculty of the UUI, I'm optimistic, will do is to put God back into science. Because if you look at science from a, from a, a God-inclusive perspective, and not just a human perspective, I think we can get it back to balance. So yes, thank you.